Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Bosworth and today we're going to talk a lot about intermittent fasting. This video is hopefully the condensed version about why you should care about intermittent fasting. I am Dr. Bosworth and I'm an internal medicine physician. I spend my time educating patients on how to reverse chronic illness, how to reverse chronic inflammation, and how to improve their health through a ketogenic diet. You don't get very long into these conversations without hearing the word fasting. And that can be kind of like the F word if you're new to the ketogenic diet. If you are new to the ketogenic diet, I would have you focus on the playlist called All Things Keto. That's for beginners to start with and work their way through. My favorite teaching tool and the one that helps fund this uh, YouTube channel is my book, Any Way You Can. You can find it on YouTube, or excuse me, you can find it on Amazon, and you can find it on Audible. My favorite version is Audible, where I read the book uh, in that version. Um, as I look at this uh, conversation, though, about fasting, I will tell you that this is a more advanced conversation and a more advanced lesson for a ketogenic uh, um, for a ketogenic understanding. So I'm first going to say that if you're the in a ketogenic diet for the first couple of months, I would not recommend this. We really do want you keto adapted before you start doing the fasting that does become very easy and very natural on a ketogenic diet. Um, what happens during those first couple of months is not only do you master this, the schedule of when eating for you is best, but you also really get a, a nice solid foundation on what foods really keep you in ketosis and promote that ketogenic state. When you move on to intermittent fasting, we really are taking your metabolism to the next level. Um, I will find patients working their way from that um, standard American diet with multiple meals in a day, and then that second week into a ketogenic diet, they're down to maybe three meals a day, and it doesn't take much longer after that that they're down to two meals a day, and then they get that OMAD, or one meal a day. Um, once they've reached one meal a day, in many ways they're doing intermittent fasting. Um, it's at that stage of the game that I start to explain things like your metabolism really starts every morning when you awaken. The sun and our circadian rhythm really do spark that body's uh, switch to turn on metabolism. And whether you're just drinking black coffee um, or even just having a small breakfast of a very ketogenic diet, that body does turn on metabolism even with the littlest of intake uh, around that morning hour. The reason it does that is everything to do with your hormones and the surge of cort cortisol that happens to wake us up in the morning and the, the triggered effects that come from that. Uh, when I look at teaching people about why it is wise to move to the next step, which is an extended fast, um, I like to use these slides to teach this. So this set of slides is going to be looking at a 72-hour fast, and these patients have never been on a ketogenic diet. They are on a standard American diet at the beginning of this. So for my ketogenic diet patients, for my, for my ketogenic patients, I will often ask them to have a 36-hour fast as their first fast, but we'll talk more about that when I'm done with these slides. Let's take a look at what patients that are not ketogenic and what happens to uh, several of their hormones and several, several of their biomarkers during a 72 hour fast. All right, so I labeled this energy increases after 72 hours of fasting. And again, this is patients uh, who are not ketogenic. So keep that in mind as we go through this. We're gonna start by looking at a graph. The graph has an X and Y axis, and along uh, the, the bottom you'll see the hours the patient has fasted. Starts with 24 to 48 and 72. The first thing we're gonna take a look at is their glucose. And again, glucose is the sugar in your system that's circulating. These patients were not overweight, and again, they were on uh, a normal carbohydrate diet. The first uh, measurement of their sugars was an average of 88. And that's a really good sugar. When patients come in, I often tell them, if you're trying to lose weight on a ketogenic diet, we really want you checking your blood sugars and we want them less than 100 uh, first thing in the morning. So these patients all actually met that goal. 
But look what happens at 24 hours. Their sugars dropped to a, uh, an average of 65, ranging between 61 and 90. And for the rest of that 72 hour fast, they were able to hold or maintain their sugars around the 65 average. A little bit dropped by the time they were 72, but this is a powerful teaching tool for what happens when you stop putting carbohydrates into your system. And this is again, a strict fast, that which was water and salt only. Let's move on to what their insulin did. Again, this is the reason that I encourage patients to do fasting. If they have hit a plateau or they've hit a comfortable zone with their ketogenic diet, or they have blood sugars that can't get below 100, I tell them the problem is your insulin. Let's start with the first test of these healthy patients, uh, not overweight, and their fasting insulin was 10. Now, that might not mean much to you, but as a physician, when I'm checking someone's insulin, I love it when it's less than five. If it's less than five, I have a ton of confidence that they are metabolically healthy, they are not squirreling away extra calories at every turn because of a high insulin state. These folks were healthy. They were not overweight. And their first insulin at the get-go was 10. But look what happens. At 24 hours, no calories going in, they were still at an average of 10. Some people were up to 16. Now, a few did get below five on that, on that measurement, but as an average, the group was still at 10.1, essentially unchanged from the first day. Insulin is that hormone that tells all of your system to store food, to slow down the metabolism, to really um, insulate, if you would, the body. It is a growth hormone, and one of the fastest things it grows is the storage inside your fat cells. At 48 hours, they dipped that insulin a little bit, um, but only to a 9. Uh, you look at 72 hours, and they did not hit the goal of 5. Um, most people were, the, actually the whole lot of them, were above, 10, above the 5 that I like my patients to be at, but they were at an average of 8. Now, the reason I drew this insulin to have a flame around it isn't because insulin is evil. It's that in most of us, insulin is the source of your inflammation. It is what keeps you firing that, um, that milieu of inflammation throughout their body. Their joints hurt, their brain doesn't work as fast, and insulin does a lot of other gnarly things like grows brain plaques in your brain leading to Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. It also grows plaques in your arteries, which increases your risk of heart disease. If I had to pick one hormone that really is the message that most of my chronic overweight patients have struggles with, it's this bad boy here, insulin. And these are healthy folks. If you look at your own insulin, you would find that most of my patients, that insulin is well above 15 and sometimes in the 20s and high 20s. What that really means is a very slow metabolism, a really difficult time losing weight, and they really have to practice that ketogenic diet to get that insulin down. Every time you take in carbohydrates, you stimulate a production of insulin. These patients for 72 hours, they didn't take in insulin, they didn't take in carbohydrates, they didn't take in any calories, and they were still making plenty of insulin by that third day. I think that is a remarkable teaching component when my patients come in and say, Doc, why are my blood sugars so high and I haven't eaten in 36 hours? And the answer is, we have to have more times where we turn off the spigot that produces insulin. Let's wrap this up with two more hormones that are very important in this story. Uh, that is your blood ketones. So blood ketones, again, can be looked at by poking your finger and looking at your ketones. And these people were not ketogenic. So on day one, their ketones, of course, were zero. They'd been feeding carbohydrates for the most of their lives. As you look at 24 hours, they were able to get their ketones up to two. By two days of fasting, by 48 hours, they were up into the four-point range. And at the end of 72 hours and into those that 80th hour, some of them made it, uh, they were almost at five ketones. What I like to point out here is when you overlay what's happening to glucose and you overlay what's happening to these ketones, that 48 and 72 hour mark is exactly where the keto flu shows up which is where the sugars have gone down and the body is making ketones as quickly as it knows how. But so many of the cells in these patients weren't ready for ketones and you could say that their parts inside their cells just weren't ready to use ketones. All of those mechanics are still turning on and there's quite a mismatch. 
their body's overproducing ketones, saying, hey, we have this extra source of fuel. Why don't you use a ketone? While just maintaining that glucose at that pretty low level um, by day two and three. If we were to follow this study a couple more days, you would actually see these ketones go down while maintaining the glucose. And what's happening is you find several of the cells adapting to using ketones and really turning on those cellular mechanics so they are able to burn a ketone. The difference between their systems when they burn a ketone versus burning glucose is the decrease in inflammation. And that's really where the benefit of a ketogenic diet shows up. As your body gets more used to burning ketones, your system has less inflammation, a higher metabolism, and more energy. Which brings me to my last slide. This is norepinephrine. Again, this isn't something we check in patients. It's only uh, checked in research. And the average when they first started this ketogenic, uh, or this experiment, was around 1,700. That doesn't mean much to most people, but what, watch what happens to norepinephrine over the next few days. Uh, let me first remind you that norepinephrine is like the gas pedal. You know that statement of fight or flight? Uh, that's, that's where epinephrine is talked about, and you can think of norepinephrine and epinephrine as partners. Epinef norepinephrine specifically talks about our brain function and how well those nerves fire. When norepinephrine is lower, our energy is lower. The higher norepinephrine gets, the more charged our neural connections are. You can think of it as an improved kind of awareness of, of your surroundings. Think of your brain just working more, more efficiently and more sharp when your norepinephrine is higher. Just like what your body would do if you were having a fight or flight uh, situation, you would be more acutely aware of what's going on. So watch what happens. By 24 hours, you see a little boost in their norepinephrine. Again, think of this as their brain energy. By 48 hours, they're up to almost double of what their norepinephrine is. And by 72 hours and on, they were at least double for where their norepinephrine was at the beginning of this study. I think this is an incredible teaching tool for watching what happens on a ketogenic diet and say, Look, that study is, again, people who were not on a ketogenic diet. So why did I go through that? It is because when you look at what happens to our metabolism on a ketogenic diet, it mimics a fasting diet. We don't do that in 48 hours. Um, there are lots of chemistry shifts that were happening in those patients, and they were under close observation to, to go to a strict fast for 72 hours. I encourage patients on a ketogenic diet after they're keto adapted to start stretching the time between meals and I like them to begin with a 36 hour fast. I want their bodies to mimic what happened in that study. I want their sugars to go down. I want their insulin to decrease and I want those ketones to rise to the next level. Every time you burst that, low, that level of ketones in your blood, you recruit a few more uh, cells to be adapted and using ketones. Uh, if you look back in the book that I wrote, Any Way You Can, I use a campfire to teach about what's the difference between your energy when you're fueled by glucose versus ketones. In glucose, I think of your campfire as fueled by pine needles or leaves, a very quick and fast energy, but it crashes down rather abruptly, leaving you fatigued. In a ketogenic state, I think of it as a log or a brick. It takes a much longer time to get that fire going, to get that log really burning, to get that brick uh, producing heat. But once you turn on those cells to the production of ketones, it's like a fire that's fueled by logs. You can add another log and it will recruit those cells into burning ketones. And the energy is stable and sustainable. You can skip a meal. You can go times without eating. And think of those times as a spark to your autophagy. You'll have to check out the other videos to better understand autophagy. I'd like to wrap it up with this. If you are on a ketogenic diet, I do not recommend a fast for the first several weeks. In my patients, I really set the goal of wait two months. Really, this isn't a race. Once you're truly keto adapted, then I start stretching that time to, a, to do your first 36-hour fast. The key to a 36-hour fast is we have two overnights, two times where you have the eight hours of sleeping. We have them eat a meal on uh, day one, uh, usually in that afternoon to evening hours. I have them get their head to bed without snacking or snitching. 
They get up the next morning and that's really their day of fasting. In my world, I often couple fasting with a, a prayer or a meditation. Whenever I get irritated or I get hungry, I, I really recall why am I fasting? What is my goal? And if I skip that, I often then find myself eating before I plan to. It's during that time of fasting that I do often find a treat for myself on the evening of that, um, at that 24 to 24 hour mark. Um, I really like using a magnesium float spa. That's Epsom salt uh, on steroids. They put like 1,500 uh, pounds of salt into those float spas. And it does a lot of things. Not only is it very relaxing, it kind of does a timeout for my brain. Um, it also keeps me away from the kitchen. And there's nothing like a magnesium float to help me sleep better. I go home that night and then again I sleep. So that's two sets of eight hours for the 16 hours of sleeping, making that 36 hour fast not as awful as it sounds. It's really one day without food. And on a ketogenic state, you really do find that your metabolism has increased. When I find patients struggling on the ketogenic diet, it's often with questions like, Doc, why are my sugars still so high? Doc, I've stopped losing weight. And it's this study that I point out to them. I show them what their sugars do in healthy people. I show them what the insulin does in healthy people. And then the ketones, and most importantly, the norepinephrine. And then I tell them, you don't need to fast 72 hours to get this when you're on a ketogenic diet. Those patients were carb adapt, carb, uh, they were on a carbohydrate diet. If you are fat adapted on a ketogenic diet, you really can get these benefits in as little as 36 hours. And it really does boost your metabolism, increase that production of ketones, and recruit a few more cells to join the team of your ketogenic state. I hope this answered a lot of questions. For those of you looking at intermittent fasting, there really is a fascinating science behind this. And the best part of the ketogenic diet is how it mimics a fasting, a fasted state without going through that uh, transition like those patients did in that study. I'm Dr. Basra signing off, helping your health get healthier one ketone at a time.